This is Sub LBC here doing the live broadcast of the Sub LBC show. And I'm sorry for the late start. Uh, I had to get some things done right here at the last moment, uh, right before we started the show. So, uh, yeah, you know, we're a little, a little bit late. I think it's about 10 after right now. Yeah, it is. So hopefully everybody is finding the link here okay, and hopefully the audio of the live broadcast is decent. Uh, if it isn't, please let me know via the real-time comment section or via Facebook Messenger or whatever. So, um, yeah, guys, in today's live broadcast, we're really going to be spending a lot of time talking about the, the specifics behind the feed regimen that I use for all of my flowering grows. And this is obviously something, a uh, concoction that I'll be using moving forward here for the next, um, well, I should say pretty much all my future cycles, uh, for, you know, that I'll probably do over the next couple of years. Um, there are going to be some little variations that I'm going to experiment with here and there. We'll talk about those um, when the time comes. But in today's episode, I really just wanted to focus on answering everybody's questions in re in regards to the feeding regimen as it apl uh, applies to bloom. So, um, yeah, oh, one other thing, too, I want to mention for all those who actually give a flying fuck about it is, uh, I guess today is Cinco de Mayo, whoop de doo <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, so for all you guys that give a shit, happy Cinco de Mayo. Hopefully it will be over soon. And, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get right into it. So, first off, guys, for, all you, for everybody who's watched my videos over the course of the last uh, few cycles, um, the success has definitely been there with some regimens and really not with others. I mean, we've seen a lot of, of different things um, over the course of the last few months, you know, running combinations of Heavy 16 with advanced nutrients, also using Aptus, as well as using Heavy 16's very own fire additive. And uh, it's been pretty clear um, that, uh, you know, of all the things that we've done, the, the first regimen clearly had the best success. Um, which was the combination of heavy 16 and advanced nutrients. So, want to go ahead and get into that a little bit here. <clears throat> so, for all you guys that want to get the specifics, grab a pen and paper, and uh, here we go. Um, now, excluding pH up and down, you know, we're just going to talk about everything else but those things. Uh, to, to make the regimen work, you're going to need all the following products. First, we start with the heavy 16 trifecta. Um, we have the um, heavy 16 bases, their bloom A and B as well as the Heavy 16 Prime Enhancer. Um, then from the, uh, whatchamacallit, the Advanced Nutrients Camp, we run the Advanced Nutrients Nirvana, uh, Big Bud, and Overdrive. Uh, bud Candy can be used with certain strains. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, from Botanicare, we run Sweet Raw, as well as Botanicare's CalMag Plus. Um, from General Hydroponics, we run Floralicious Plus. And then from uh, Plant Success, I believe that's the name of the company, uh, the guys who make Great White, we use Great White and the other beneficial that they have, the liquid soluble called Orca. And that's it. Uh, there's, there's nothing else to it. It's very simplified. Now, before we get into the specifics, um, one thing that I want to mention that I found was, was kind of funny is that a lot of people, and not a lot of people actually, I, I keep saying that, but it's not really true. Uh, some people uh, have commented on the fact that you know, I had once had a very negative attitude about advanced nutrients, and I've somehow come around, and that's not really the case. Um, for anyone who's even remotely familiar with advanced nutrients line, uh, I use very little of their line. You know, remember, guys, we're not using Connoisseur, we're not using Sensi Blue, maybe, we're not using um, Iguana in any way, shape, or form, we're not using uh, Hammerhead, <laughs> you know, we're not using Bud Igniter. We're not using Super Kush, I'm sorry, uh, Cushy Kush or Bud Factor X. We don't use any of the uh, Super Earth Teas. We don't use F1H1 from Dr. Eggies. I don't even know if they still make that product anymore. Um, we don't use Sensizyme. We don't use Voodoo Juice. We don't use Tarantula. We don't use Piranha. Um, we don't use Final Phase. We don't use B52. We don't use Wet Betty. Um, I think that covers most of the advanced nutrients products that I don't use. Uh, but suffice it to say, um, a lot of their line, I think, is just pretty much overpriced crap. And that still holds true to this day. Oh, Rhino Skin, right? Of course, can't forget that obvious example. Um, so I really only focus on the products that give me the most bang for buck and pretty much exclude most of the rest. 
So I want to kind of, you know, put that out there for, for people that think, you know, that I'm going all pro advanced. I mean, at this point, we're just running Jungle Juice because it's free, and the rest of the regimen will only use, you know, three products out of their entire line of 20 plus products. So why do I use the products that I do? Well, everything, of course, guys, uh, in my world is, is driven by results. I really don't give a shit about bragging rights, you know, being team advanced, team whatever. Um, I'm all, all I care about is results. But I do have somewhat of an ideology behind why I select the products that I do. And it's really based on the, you know, principle of trying to get all the functions of the nutrients with as little products as possible. Um, so that kind of takes us to where we, to where we began. Okay, so starts with the, the products from Heavy 16. Now, the Heavy 16 base nutrients are more or less 100% pure synthetic nutrients. In fact, for anyone who wants to know a little bit about them, you know, you can obviously look up their composition, but very similar to the, the makeup of the Advanced Nutrients Connoisseur line, to be honest, but with two major differences. Um, firstly, is that with the Heavy 16 nutrients, if you uh, buy them in large enough quantities, I mean, you can get them for as cheap as about $20 per gallon, which is like half the, um, whatchamacallit, like half the cost of Advanced Nutrients Connoisseur, I would say, uh, significantly less than just about every other advanced base out there. And at $20 a gallon, I mean, Jesus, you know, we're, we're almost down to like CNS-17 type prices to get a nutrient that is pretty much every bit as good as Advanced Nutrients Connoisseur minus aftertake, uh, aftertaste problems, which is something that I have noticed with running Connoisseur before in the past. There's just somewhat of an aftertaste that you get when you run that stuff. You know, I've seen it multiple times with, uh, with Blue Dream. And, um, yeah, but other than that, Connoisseur would be a great nutrient, you know, if it wasn't so damn expensive. But Heavy 16 has, has really done a great job of, of creating a nutrient that's probably equal to, if not better than, in performance without aftertaste problems. And it works incredibly well with what I think is the most important product in the regimen, which is the Heavy 16 Prime Enhancer. Now, Prime Enhancer obviously comes in the biocatalyst category, okay? Um, it's pretty much up there with like your Liquid Karma type products, um, Uptake from Psycho, even Floorlicious Plus from GH. Um, they can be compared against. Um, other products that are somewhat similar, I think, would be like Soul Synthetics, uh, what is it, um, their Infinity product. And um, there's a few others. You know, for anyone who's familiar with Biocatalysts, uh, the, the, the Prime is, is pretty much in those ranges. But what I really love about Prime is the fact that it contains so many components that allow you to not have to use other additives and supplements in your regimen, specifically the potassium silicate and vitamin B supplements that come in the, the Biocatalyst product Prime. Um, you also get a, a natural source of organic carbohydrates in the form of molasses. So pretty much don't need to really run a synthesized carbohydrate or a carbosynthesizer, um, such as liquid carboload, which is another product from Advanced I, I no longer use anymore. So with Prime, you really get all those things, you know, vitamin B1 supplement, um, potassium silicate, biocatalyst, as well as a, uh, you know, a natural source of sugar for whatever beneficials or rhizospheric environment you want to keep up, which is what the bio biocatalyst product is really mostly designed for. And from a price perspective, you know, based on its application rate, it's not bad. The, uh, you know, I think it's only like $10 more per gallon than the Botanicare Liquid Karma and does a whole hell of a lot more. If you were to go with, you know, Liquid Karma as your primary biocatalyst, you would have to buy their molasses product to add those carbohydrates. Um, I believe that Botanicare just released a new, like, you know, Vitamino product that is basically a, a vitamin B52 supplement. And then, of course, mixed with Silica Blast, you'd have to add all those Botanicare products to get what you get in just one product with Prime Enhancer from Heavy 16. And I really think uh, that that stuff is huge. You know, getting all those products in one bottle and also to work properly is huge. So everything really uh, relies on the Heavy 16 trifecta as the foundation. So that now takes us to other products that we use. And keeping on the biocatalyst route, or t keeping on the biocatalyst subject, I should say, um, I really think that it's important to try to diversify your biocatalyst as much as possible. And to use as many as possible to really try to 
you know, use the, the various methods of transport and breakdown of nutrients for your plants um, as opposed to just pumping your plants full of salts or synthetics or chemicals or whatever it may be. Um, I have s seen some growers that like to push high PPMs, you know, in, in excess of 1,500, 1,600, even growing in environments such as cocoa. But uh, I really don't like doing that. You know, if you look at the suggested application rates for the um, the AB nutrients, right, it's like it starts at 8, ends at 12, and I never, ever take it above 8 uh, because of the fact that I use boosters and because of the fact that I really want to leverage the uh, the different biocatalysts and organic components to achieve the uptake, you know, not just stuffing my plants full of shit. So for the secondary biocatalyst that I use, of course, is the Advanced Nutrients Nirvana. And there's two reasons why I use Advanced Nirvana. Uh, firstly, like I said, I want to expand upon the, the makeup of my biocatalysts. But um, it really kicks ass. I mean, it adds a lot of texture to the plants. Um, I've noticed uh, with Advanced Nutrients Nirvana that there's a lot of components that make up Nirvana that you don't find in most other biocatalysts, such as the, you know, the alfalfa, the yucca extracts. And um, I believe it uses a different species of kelp or seaweed that is not present in the uh, the prime enhancer. So there's very little overlap there in regards to composition, but there is at least um, a lot of overlap in function, which is fine. You know, I've said many times before that uh, if you are going to stack anything, then stack your organics. And I do a lot of that. You know, we'll use up to three biocatalysts um, at pretty much maximum strength throughout most of the uh, the grow. And uh, which is why the whole Aptis line completely blows me away because, you know, Aptis would be the first product that I'd ever used that is quote-unquote fully organic but yet cannot be stacked with other organics. So that really causes me to, to, to bring into question how organic Aptis nutrients actually are. And I don't think very much so. I mean, grab an Aptis bottle, look what they're made out of, and, and tell me that sounds anything organic to you. Um, and I, and I think I've also said, too, that Aptis probably would have a zero chance of, of passing OMRI approval for organic. Just don't think so. It's, it's mostly just fraud. <clears throat> but anyways, yeah, guys, we like to mix up the biocatalysts. The, uh, the third one I like to use, too, is the, uh, the General Hydroponics Floralicious Plus. Now, with Floralicious Plus, um, you know, this is probably one of the products that I probably could just cut out of the regimen altogether. But the only reason why I keep messing around with it is because of price, to be to be honest, and to you know get something from GH into the regimen, to be honest too. Um, but yeah, guys, at about twenty dollars per liter, in an application rate of one milliliter per gallon, or only fifty milliliters per reservoir, um, you know that's a lot of reservoirs, guys. You can essentially do like twenty reservoirs on twenty dollars, so that's literally one dollar per application for the Floralicious Plus. Um, the only thing that really makes it unique versus other biocatalysts is it's uh, it's kind of high NPK rating. You know, it's a it's a two zero zero, I believe, um, but that really doesn't account for much because the application rate is so low. If you were to compare it to say a product such as CalMag Plus, which is also a two zero zero, keep in mind that the general application rate for that product is anywhere between two hundred fifty to five hundred milliliters per uh, fifty gallon reservoir, right? Uh, whereas the two zero zero you know, you're not using the uh, Floralicious at anywhere close to that. So it's somewhat irrelevant at this point, and to be honest, it is probably something I could cut. Um, not really something that you would, uh, you know, use for a nitrogen booster. You, you wouldn't want to introduce Floralicious at like 200 mils per. I don't even know if it would even cause a problem, but not recommended to be used that way. It's really just one of those products that I use to give me three different biocatalysts. But, but again, you know, it, it is questionable whether or not it really adds anything to what I'm doing. But at the price of twenty dollars per liter, surely it doesn't do anything bad. You know what I mean? So fuck it at this point. But I at least want to share everyone's attitude um, that I have about Floralicious Plus. So um, as far as beneficials are concerned, uh, like I said earlier, I avoid the really high-priced bullshit products such as the Voodoo Juice, Tarantula, and Piranha. You know these products are incredibly expensive, and you know the way they're being sold to people and the way that they're told to be used. I think is absolutely insane. Um, anyone who introduces 400 milliliters or more of Voodoo Juice to a 55-gallon reservoir at that price point is a straight-up fucking idiot. Fucking idiot. 
Um, if you're going to be using something that costs you know three hundred to four hundred dollars a gallon, um, you know this is something you'd probably want to dilute down to a, a one gallon application and put it right into your root zone directly. These are not products um, that you should be using per recommend per recommendation of the manufacturer because they're just trying to steal from you. You know they're they're basically just going after your money and robbing you blind. Uh, Voodoo juice is the the best example of this. Uh, so what I like to do with my beneficials, guys, is I, I use you know three different kinds. Uh, one I haven't talked about, but as far as the over-the-counter products, um, we obviously work with the Great White first, and we like to introduce that stuff in its pure powder form directly to the uh, the root zone at time of transplant. And the main reason for this is that you know Great White, as far as its composition, has probably the most diverse collection of beneficial bacteria and beneficial funguses that you will ever get in a single product. Um, there are a couple other, a couple others are, are a little bit, are somewhat competitive. But uh, when you factor in price and um, you know just availability, you know really the the great white is kind of where it's at. You can pretty much get that product anywhere. And even though it doesn't have the you know million colony forming units of of various bacillus strains, although it does have most of, if not all, of the bacillus strains featured in Voodoo Juice, as well as a lot of other things. Um, you can always step up the amount of application to compensate. You know, I mean, colony forming units per cubic centimeter can be increased or decreased based on application rate with Voodoo Juice as well. So you kind of do the same thing with Great White, and you end up saving yourself literally hundreds of dollars. Um, and the Great White lasts a lot longer. I like to introduce that stuff directly into the uh, you know root zone at the time of transplant to make sure that the roots are making direct contact with it. And uh, yeah, you'll get the same exact results you get from Voodoo Juice um, for a fraction of the price. But I still do believe that it's worth it to do a liquid soluble to kind of, you know, again, step up beneficials. You know, you figure if you are going to be maxing out on, on biocatalysts and biocatalyst diversity, then you also want to do the same with beneficials, which is why I like to use the, uh, the Orca, made by the same company as Great White, uh, the plant success. And with Orca, again, you know, very uh, cheap, liquid soluble, got great composition, and incredibly concentrated. And I use it at like you know double or triple dosage with uh, no no drawbacks, and I absolutely love it. But one thing that I think you should also do if you, for all you guys that actually care about beneficials is to introduce some kind of live tea if you've got the opportunity. And for a very long time, I have not been able to really get a hand my hands on live teas. Uh, Green Door Hydroponics just recently started carrying them. I believe like not even a month ago or barely a month ago. And uh, you know they're between ten to fifteen dollars per gallon, depending on the kind of discounts that you get. And uh, yeah, big thing to introduce if you want, and it's going to save you a hell of a lot more money uh, over using products like Voodoo because you know the gallons you can evenly distribute those to you know two to four gallons over sixteen plants. It'll set you back forty dollars, and it's going to be a true live injection of beneficial which is something that not even Voodoo Juice can do. You know, this is an over-the-counter uh, type product, and it's just not going to be able to compete with a live brew, um, either in performance or price. So, yeah, if you want to really step up your game in regards to that, don't do it um, with ridiculous products like Voodoo Juice, Piranha, Tarantula. Buy the shit live, use Great White Orca, save yourself a ton of money, get the exact same performance. So, that now takes us to the primary boosters, or the primary additives, and this is really where we saw the big changes, you know, is by fucking around with these types of products. Um, you know, Aptis was kind of fucked right out of the gates, didn't really seem to play very well with the SFE or with the, the Heavy 16 products. <clears throat> and uh, everything was going pretty well with the fire grows until we actually started to introduce fire. And I do believe that there are some uh, PGR components in fire. And that bothers me a bit. Uh, I'd like to do some more research on it. You know, fire is one of those products I still look at. I'm just like, why the fuck did things go so weird? You know, because we did have one fire grow that just fucking killed it. You know, and uh, and that we were never able to repeat those results. And you know, it still to this very day bothers me. But for whatever reason, guys, as, uh, be it as it may, the uh, advanced nutrients primary additives really kick ass. You know, with with heavy sixteen, and of course I'm talking about the uh, big bud and overdrive, and I'm definitely not talking about bud igniter. Um, but Igniter is clearly one of the, I think I rated it as one of the worst products made by Advanced Nutrients, uh, you know, as far as it being an absolute ripoff, doing absolutely nothing, but yet costing a fortune at upwards of about almost $100 per quart or per liter. Um, guys, that's 
that is absolutely insane. Um, you know, for a product that does so little, or if you know, a product that does pretty much next to nothing, at that price point. Wow, you know, and and to be honest, I, I stay away from all the uh, the earlier type products. You know, generally the 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 three part additives are broken into early flower, mid flower, late flower, and I don't even use the early flower stuff. I just don't find it useful. You know, Big Bud generally is good to start using right at the beginning of the second week. So we're only talking one week's one week of feeding, anyways. And I would rather use that first week to run a lower ppm type solution in order to get the most out of my rhizosphere as I'm trying to set it up. So, you know, pr products like Bud Igniter are just complete garbage. If you do want to use something like that that's incredibly cheap and just want to do it for shits and giggles, then I highly recommend using the Open Sesame um, Concentrate from Fox Farm. Or maybe even trying out their whole line, you know, Fox Farm to BC Blooms to Cha-Ching. Because I've had a lot of success running that stuff in the past. But if you just want to do the, the early flower additive, then just run um, open sesame and then transition over to Big Bud Overdrive. But yeah, guys, Big Bud and Overdrive really kick ass. Um, by far gotten some of my best results using those products, whether or not I was running advanced nutrients bases or not. But, um, you know, so far, guys, we've seen some really awesome stuff happening in the Epic 4K. Not even in the most recent update, but just the stuff that's happened over the last four days has been pretty phenomenal. And in fact, we're going to do a quick video update right after this show is over. To show you guys um, what's been, what's been going on with that grow. So, uh, as far as other products that we need to talk about, um, enzymes are always important. And for enzymes, we run the best. Um, Hygrozyme being the best. I, I don't think there's too many people that um, grow or whatever that have you know bad things to say about Hygrozyme. And uh, that pretty much rounds it up. You know, you can see that we don't really use that many products. Again, you know, uh, we use the Heavy 16 A and B, Prime Enhancer, Big Bud, Overdrive, um, <clears throat> Orca, Great White, Hygrozyme, Floralicious Plus, and uh, CalMag Plus, and Sweet Raw. So, oh yeah, let's talk about the Botanicare products. I haven't gotten to those yet. Um, I know that they don't really get that much, uh, you know, coverage, but they're incredibly important. The uh, CalMag Plus is obvious, you know, if you want to have a, a CalMag supplement, or I should say you should always have a CalMag supplement if you're going to use one. I think that Botanicare is one of the best. Very good on price, very good on effectiveness, and I've noticed that almost all calcium magnesium supplements are used uh, pretty much in the same you know, general application rate, between 5 to 10 milliliters per gallon. Um, Hygrozyme, we use a 5 milliliters per gallon all the time, and then we also have the, uh, the Sweet Raw, which we pretty much start using the same time we start using Big Bud which is pretty much an aromatic product. I used to think of it more of as a carbosynthesizer, but it's not really that as much as it is. It's really a uh, kind of like a mag amp, to be honest. It's a 100% uh, magnesium sulfate derived, um, very low NPK ratio, but you know, obviously very high levels of magnesium. And with uh, finicky strains such as SF SFBOG, those, uh, those boosted magnesium amounts really help in uh, just keeping the plant vibrant and to really bring out smell and all the aromatic features just really kicks butt. And outside of the sweet raw, I also like to use the advanced nutrients bud candy, but not on OG strains. You know, generally I save the bud candy for Blue Dream or anything that's kind of fruity. But if you wanted to, you could run the Botanicare sweet uh, for any of those. There's there's a raspberry sweet, or I should say there's a berry sweet, the sweet raw, and the citrus. So. You can mix it up any way you want, you know, with the sour diesels or so, any kind of the, the lemon or the orange strains like Orange Crush, you obviously run citrus. If you're running up berry strains such as Blueberry or Blue Dream, then you run berry. But if you're trying to go after just the, the pure, um, you know, the pure herb as it is, you know, such as strains with like, I don't know, OG, obviously, sour diesel maybe, um, any of those kind of strains, then the Sweet Raw is the uh, the kind of the go-to choice. Now, sweet is a lot more expensive than bud candy um, is in regards to comparative application rate and price. So with that being said, you know, generally bud candy is the better choice, unless, of course, you are running the OG strains like I generally do. So, um, yeah, that makes up all the products. So now let's talk about how those products are applied. It's really, really simple, guys. Um, you know, we're not going to talk about veg here and veg transition, only to... You know, mention the, uh, the the introduction of Great White at time of transplant, 
And if figuring uh, that you've gotten that far, your first reservoir is always going to be the same. And it's going to comprise of the trifecta, you know, heavy 16 A and B prime. Um, the A and B will be used at, at uh, 8 milliliters per gallon each, um, or about 400 milliliters on a 55 gallon reservoir treated at 50 gallons. And then a uh, dose of prime enhancer at 10 milliliters per gallon or 500 milliliters for a 55 gallon reservoir. So obviously full strength bases, uh, at least you know by my, where I put full strength, and then also the addition of prime. Do not add any big bud or overdrive, um, but you do add Orca. And you also want to run your CalMag supplement, and um, that is pretty much it. You know, it's very, very low strength. And the reason why it is is because you are focusing on trying to build up a healthy rhizosphere. And you really can't do that when you're spiking PPMs all crazy by running all kinds of, you know, nutty boosters and additives. And they're just not ready. Uh, the plants are going through kind of a stressful transition as they go from 24 hours of light down to 12-12. So the last thing you want to do is just feed them any kinds of crazy nutrient concoctions or anything with unusually high PPM. So base AB, prime enhancer, calcium, magnesium supplement, uh, liquid soluble beneficial. And uh, this would also be a good time to introduce any kind of live teas that you want your plants to start working on. Um, but you're really focusing on rhizosphere. That's kind of the big goal. And as this reservoir gets used up, it's not a reservoir you generally have to daisy chain. The, uh, the PPMs on a res like this generally don't get very far above 1,000 or so PPMs, even if you're using a, a two-part filtered water source versus RO. You know, your PPMs are generally going to be very, very low. Um, this would be the only time, too, that you might want to consider using th Super Thrive. And, you know, although Super Thrive uh, is kind of a B1 supplement, you know, obviously derived partially from thiamine hydrochloride, there are a lot of stims and, and uh, you know, boosters in that product that, that do somewhat assist with transplant. But this is not something that you want to use again in the future. So you will generally keep your plants on this regimen for about 10 days or so before you actually transition them over into the, the first stage of budding, which is, you know, where you start introducing big bud, you know, somewhere between the first and the second week. So as you get into that, um, you're going to start introducing big bud in always the same amounts, you know, 8 milliliters per gallon on a 55-gallon reservoir, 400 milliliters, the exact same amount that you use on your bases, which are also each 400 milliliters. Um, you will continue to use Prime Enhancer, um, CalMag supplements, um, again, you can go ahead and use. And, of course, as you start using Big Bud, you want to start introducing the Botanicare Sweet Raw at 10 milliliters per gallon or 500 milliliters for the entire reservoir. And I think I may, may have mentioned this before, but I generally do not like to use um, any, any particular specific product in excess of 500 milliliters per 55-gallon reservoir, even if it recommends me to do so. I, I generally like to cap that out. So we've got Big Bud, A and B, all at 400 milliliters. We have the Prime Enhancer again at 500 milliliters or, you know, 10 mils per gallon. Um, we are starting up Big Bud. We're introducing Sweet Raw, uh, oh, Hygrozyme always um, for the first two reservoirs. In fact, every single reservoir up into the last or second to last feeding re reservoir should contain Hygrozyme. I'm always introducing it at 5 milliliters per gallon or in my case, uh, 250 milliliters for the 55-gallon reservoir. And also, the first Big Bud Reservoir will also be the last in which we try to inject live beneficials in the form of Orca, um, you know, into the uh, the regimen as a, a feeding additive. Because, you know, once PPM starts spiking, especially when you start using overdrive, there's really no point to keep trying to, be, you know, in, introduce beneficials. You're, you're just kind of working against yourself. Um, you're hoping that you've established whatever rises fear you can uh, within the first couple of weeks, but after that, um, that stuff is pretty much on its own. It's going to have to, you know, survive from the uh, the stuff that you give it in the form of prime to keep it going. But towards the end, you know, the rhizosphere is probably going to die out, uh, you know, from just the constant presence of synth of synthetic nutrients. But by the end, who cares? You know, the the plants are getting ready to be taken down anyways. So in any case, guys, um, as we move along, uh, you know, the Big Bud reservoirs are all pretty much the same. Uh, then Big Bud simply transfers over to Overdrive, and you're pretty much doing more of the same stuff. Uh, talking about the Floralicious Plus, um, again, you know, one milliliter per gallon, 50 um, milliliters per 55-gallon reservoir. 
And um, this is something you can pretty much introduce if you want to, if you don't want to. It doesn't really matter. So that now takes us to what we do in between the feeding reservoirs. Um, like I've said in, in a lot of previous videos, that when we're doing the feeding, it's not just we're, we're not just feeding, um, you know, and then daisy chaining into another full strength res over and over and over again. You know, we don't do that. Um, it's always a good idea to introduce fresh water into your plants. And I want to start this portion by kind of talking about, I guess, a somewhat of a disclaimer, because uh, it is important to note that this entire system is really based on, um, you know, running a 4K system with 16 7 gallon plants or doing a 4K system with uh, 24 5 gallon plants. And the reason why is because, generally speaking, when you do a, a watering with this type of setup, you can expect to extinguish, you know, on average about two thirds to, or I should say, uh, yeah, two thirds to three quarters of the, uh, the entire contents of the res. You know, it's pretty much going to be used on the primary feeding. And what you want to do after every feeding is to displace that with 100% fresh water. Um, doing this for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason why you're doing it is obviously to uh, introduce a significant amount of fresh water into your plants in between every watering, which is very, very good for the plants. Uh, the plants like to have, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a fresh watering just to clear out whatever crap that might be building up in their, uh, their root zone. And the second reason why is because since you're lowering the PPM so much, um, it is going to open up the uh, you know the ceiling a little bit for you to add spikers. And uh, what I'm talking about, spikers are are basically products that you're already using or other additional products you want to introduce, but you don't want to do it with a full strength feeding. You know, you want to do it on a little bit more of a lax feeding, so the plants can deal with things a little bit better. <clears throat> and those uh, the spikers I like to use the most are either the um, the CalMag Plus from Botanicare or the Sweet Raw. These are really great spikers to use in between. It's so like for instance, you know, if you're somewhere hunting around in third week, noticing the plants are, you know, getting a little bit um, you know, a little bit on the yellow side, uh, you know, adding CalMag at, at five mils per on the main mix and then at full strength at ten mils per on the spiker mix is generally going to be a very good way to handle that. And you're going to be able to do stuff like that without, you know, shocking the plants or introducing, um, you know, feed that, in which the PPMs are just way too high. Uh, by always using your diluted reservoir to introduce your spikers, you're never going to have that problem. Um, I've also noticed, too, guys, recently, and we're going to talk about this in my uh, the, the video update we're going to do right after the show, that towards the end of the grow, when you're getting towards the very last diluted reservoir, that... Um, doing a, an overdrive spike can be incredibly effective uh, towards the end to really get some late incredibly kick-ass bud development and generally speaking um, on the very last feeding reservoir or the very last diluted feeding reservoir um, I've historically done a, uh, a sweet raw spike you know full 500 milliliters for that res you know just to get a nice strong finish but on this last one we did that combined with an overdrive spike. You know, I figured, fuck it. You know, the plants are huge. Um, there's obviously not going to be a problem with them taking this. And you know, after adding everything together, overall PPMs were just barely over 800, which is 500 PPM shy of what my my main mix will normally be. So not really worried about you know burning the plants. But right after introducing that, guys, about 24 or 48 hours later, we looked at them. It was like, holy fuck. You know, there was a, a significant noticeable or significantly noticeable increase in size with the buds after adding that uh, that overdrive spike at the end. So we are going to talk about that in the video, and I think it's uh, something that, that a lot of people should try with their their herb, especially if they have a really good grow going and they just want to make it extra special. I think that last uh, diluted reservoir should should definitely um, contain an overdrive spike. I think it's going to work out great for most strains, you know. Um, and that's pretty much it, guys. You know, we really try to leverage biocatalysts more than pumping, you know, synthetic salts and nutrients into the plants. And uh, we start with that, and then we also make sure that PPMs are always controlled by introducing the, uh, the fresh water into the, the plants with every other watering. So there's never any kind of excessive buildup. And this is incredibly important for me, <clears throat> as well as any other grower, that is doing somewhat of a zero runoff style system. Now, I am not 100% zero runoff technically at this point. Um, we actually do, you know, introduce a lot of water into the plants from time to time, and we vacuum a lot of water out of the saucers. So, 
we are getting somewhat of a runoff effect more than we have before, although it's not, uh, you know, probably quite as good as someone who's able to just freely water their plants and let that shit drain out into the floor. You know, clearly I don't have that option, but, you know, we are getting away from, I guess, a true, quote-unquote, zero runoff, you know, I should say minimal runoff system. So if you're doing very minimal runoff, um, you know, the introduction of the, of the fresh water between every heavy watering, I think, is even more important. You know, obviously more important than people that are doing, um, you know, just pure soil with 100% runoff or even like some kind of hydroponic system, you know. But yeah, guys, it's an excellent regimen. Um, it's been really kicking ass. It's something that I want to detail, you know, maybe a little bit even more in the future and just kind of keep bringing home, especially when you guys start to see the, the crazy consistent results we're going to be getting. And that's my prediction, you know, moving forward. We're going to get some really, really consistent results uh, from doing it this way. So let's uh, go ahead and see what everyone has to say here about the regimen. Looks like we've got a bunch of comments and um, got about 60 or so people here watching the show, which is great. And let's see what we got here. Do, 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 do. And this is, uh, I guess, John Gallagher says, um, for a first time grow, 600 watts, would you use Botanicare or... Heavy 16. Uh, for first time grow, I'd use either one. I think that either one, um, you would have great results, to be honest. Um, right after that here, Joe N says, have you ever tried CarboLoad from Advanced Nutrients? And uh, yeah, of course I have, many times. And hold on, guys. This goddamn, I really hate the way YouTube does the, the comment management for the live show. It's just a fucking pain in the ass. Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, do you recommend adjusting wing reflectors for bloom versus air cooled? Fuck yeah! I mean, why do you think I use them? You know, I don't use any non air cooled system for bloom at this point. Um, let's see. Super Thrive beats all B vitamins. Thrive Alive B one is good too. I don't like B fifty two. Um, okay, that's great. Although Super Thrive um, does, n I don't really know if it beats all B vitamins. I don't personally love B fifty two either, but. Um, it's difficult to argue with the uh, the different types of vitamins that it has, and a lot of pro people that, that use that product really love it. Um, but to me, B52, as well as most B subs, are just incredibly overpriced and you know more or less useless if you're running uh, the uh, the prime from Heavy 16. And uh, let's see, everyone's happy with the quality of the audio. Um, Fubar's Fantasy wants to know how long after applying Avid. Do you notice that the mites are dead gone? Should one application of Avid plus Floramite three to five days later be sufficient to get rid of an infestation? Uh, it depends, uh, mostly on the size of your plants. I mean, if we're talking really, really bushed out mother plants, then you may never get rid of them. Uh, you know, anything up until about a teen size plant, we get really great coverage. Um, you know, a combination of Avid and Floramite uh, three to five days later should be sufficient uh, to get rid of an infestation, but there's no guarantee. You might have to also bust out Judo at some point in the future and, you know, maybe do another Avid spray. So, yeah, be real careful with uh, thinking that they're gone because, generally speaking, when the grower starts thinking this shit's gone is right when they come back and just destroy all your shit. Um, let's see here. I'd like to see a run with just Heavy 16 bases. And uh, my response to that, um, Albone 3000, is go for it, you know, if you want to see it and do it. You know, and compare it against one with, with boosters and report back. I'm pretty sure the ones that have boosters are going to be looking a lot better. Let's see what else anyone here is saying. Uh, it's from Wayne Longus. It says, do you have any thoughts on the Lucas formula and the theory of improving environmental conditions rather than providing additives? Well, um, you know, I try to improve environmental conditions as best as I can. I, I certainly do not group environmental conditions and additives in the same boat. You know, those, those are two problems that are kind of attacked independently. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know exactly what it was being uh, proposed here. Um, I really don't have any thoughts on Lucas formula as of yet. I, I really don't have any plans of using the, uh, the three-part grow nutrients or the three-part bloom nutrients that I use, or I should just say the three-part nutrients. Um, in any kind of, uh, you know, flowering application. I really have no interest in it. Done enough, done enough experimenting, I think, at this point. I don't want to do any more. So, yeah, that's pretty much my, uh, my, my thinking on that. 
Um, let's see. Mr. Canic Crazy says, hey, I was wondering, the biggest difference you noticed between the Sensi two-part base with advanced additives versus Heavy 16 base with AN additives. Um, there is no big difference, to be honest with you. Uh, I think the biggest, I think that's what you're asking, is taste, is aftertaste problems. Um, this is something that's been notorious with advanced. I think that a lot of people will kind of, you know, back me up on this one, is that the, uh, the Sensi Bloom AB bases, as well as Connoisseur, have uh, consistently, or at least with, in my case, I've consistently detected aftertaste with those. Uh, Bud Candy also, with certain strains, it seems noticeable. Like you can tell that a specific plant was grown with Bud Candy because of the way it, it smells and tastes. You know, it kind of adds this like bubblegum kind of taste to things and smell as well. Um, beca because of certain strains you might grow, it's not detectable, which is great. And I still think Bud Candy is a great product, but I really didn't care for the aftertaste problems that I had when using Sensi Bloom AB as well as Connoisseur. So I would say if there's a big, huge difference between the products, that's where it is. Um, aside from uh, performance, they're all pretty much the same, to be honest. Very good products. But um, you know, with Heavy 16 being at $20 per gallon, who in the fuck wants to grow with Advanced at that point? You know what I'm saying? You've got to be intelligent about this shit. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Big Bud Organic is coming out soon. Great, I guess. Um, See, it looks like the the goddamn uh, the straight. Yeah, it's like it's like it loads the comments three or four different fucking times, and it becomes difficult to read. But anyways, Professor Green Thumb says that he uh, wants me to do a botanic care synthetic line test, and that's not going to happen. Um, you know, in fact, I've been looking at botanic care's a lot of their newer products that have been coming out. And they're kind of going away from where I like to be. Um, you know, where I'm trying to consolidate. And, and chop off a lot of products that I don't want to use anymore and get them all consolidated into a, into a very low number of core products. Uh, Botanicare seems to be kind of breaking off and coming out with more additives to be more competitive with uh, lines like Advanced Nutrients, which is really kind of going away from what they've done. And I think that if they were going to do that, they should have taken a product such as Hydroplex and uh, you know either split it up <clears throat> or added a, another additive to be used with Hydroplex, like maybe a more specific late finishing type product. Um, what they don't need to be doing is, you know, coming out with like, you know, like another three part and like all these different fucking things. You know, I don't really know. And I ha it's been so long since I've used Botanic here at this point that, uh, you know, I really have no real interest to go back, uh, you know, unless they start coming out with something that's, you know, it looks like it's, it's going incredibly cannabis centric, but it's been a while, you know. Uh, not to say that I would mind doing a Pure Blend Pro Grow. Um, I really still like their products. That they work really well, especially good for noobs who want to use one parts in bloom. But you know, outside of that, yeah. Um, any tips on how to mix newts in order to avoid lockouts? Yes, um, it's really easy. Uh, you know, obviously you want to keep your water in in circulation at all times, and you want want to make sure you introduce everything separate from one another, you know, that's a great way to do it. And also keep the PPMs uh, overall, uh, you know, whatever your mix is going to be, to keep those PPMs incredibly low. Uh, like I said in uh, some previous videos, I don't like my stuff ever, under any circumstances, going over 1400 total. You know, if they start getting up to 1360, 1390-ish, right around there, um, I'm capped out. You know, that'll be like my peak reservoir. I don't want to go one uh, part per million over that if I can avoid it. Um, you know, the moment you start reaching your PPM ceiling, um, you start getting a lot of lockout problems, especially if the water starts to evaporate in the reservoir, PPMs continue to spike, um, you'll start getting, you know, molecules will start getting muddled up. You'll you get a lot of bonding, especially if the, the, P, uh, the pH starts running amok, then you'll, you'll run into real problems. So uh, the best way to do it really is just to, you know, keep pH stability, introduce all your products in low, low amounts and separate from one another, and keep the overall PPMs low. So uh, I think that that's pretty much covering all of the, uh, the real-time comments here. And let's see, King9968 says, they do, it's called Ripe for Overdrive. Actually, that is incorrect. Um, Ripe is actually a base nutrient um, that just has a modified um, NPK ratio to be used as a finisher if you're running the CNS17 line. Um, if you are actually running the Pure Blend Pro line, then uh, 
I don't even believe that RIPE is part of the regimen. You know, RIPE is really just a CNS-17 thing. So you run your CNS-17 base, uh, just the standard CNS-17, and as you get towards the end, you run RIPE. Uh, but, you know, I'm not, like, the hugest fan of RIPE. I, I've, I've messed around with it a little bit. Uh, might consider, you know, I, or I should say I've tried doing, I think, one time a, an entire RIPE grow, just using it from start to finish, and that really didn't go too well. Uh, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of CNS. Um, I think it's great price-wise, but uh, if you're looking for a pure synthetic nutrient, you know, go with you know the heavy 16. I mean, sure, it's going to cost you more uh, because you have to buy two products versus one. But at twenty dollars a gallon, they're almost about the same price. Uh, you know, technically, I guess double for the uh, the heavy 16. But you're using twice as much, and you're getting you know literally twice as twice the performance, especially when combined with Prime. And uh, it's also uh, something to note too that if you are running CNS 17, it is recommended from uh, Botanicare to also run their um, you know their compost tea, which I believe they've unif unified into one product. But they used to have a you know the original pure blend compost for veg and bloom, and CNS is designed to be used with that product. So in a sense, you know to get the most out of CNS 17, you've got to buy the other product as well. And um, yeah, you know whatever, fuck CNS 17. I I I'd much rather. Uh, grow with Pure Blend Pro or something else. So, um, let's see. Got a whole bunch of comments just came in. Uh, do you water immediately after putting the great white on the cocoa or just scoop, sprinkle on cocoa transplant? Um, well, we uh, we sprinkle the... Well, I mean, first, the, the, the bucket's only filled about halfway. And then we sprinkle a bunch of the uh, great white right at the square area where the, the root rock will block something to go. And we'll do anywhere between a teaspoon to a whole tablespoon. You know, maybe, you know, let's just say a tablespoon, right? You know, right in that area. And then after we're done packing all the rest of the cocoa in, then we go ahead and do a full-blown watering. So, yeah, yeah. And I guess uh, King9968 uh, says same ingredients as overdrive. Mm, if you say so, um, although have you ever seen ripe and, and looked at it compared to overdrive? Uh... I don't think they're made of the same ingredients at all. Um, I'd have to look at the, the actual derived components, but whatever is being done in processing, um, you couldn't get a different result, overdrive versus CNS. Um, CNS is literally like fucking jism in the bottle. Uh, it's like a very creamy, uh, opaque liquid versus overdrive, which is a pure fluid, um, you know, and it's like it's a transparent liquid. Uh, NPK ratios are are roughly the same, but the ingredients and the process for manufacturing, I don't think it any be any more further apart. Uh, I never tried using Ripe in place of overdrive, and for all I know, it could work just as well. But it's not, Ripe is not designed to be used along with CNS-17, I guess what I'm saying. CNS-17 Ripe is a base just with modified NPK ratio. I guess trying to basically turn the base nutrient into a base plus booster, at least in regards to its NPK and effectiveness, but I think you're better off, you know, running two separate products to get those uh, kinds of results. So um, let's see if we have anything going on here in the Q and A. Uh, this is an episode that's not going to be able to run quite as long as some have in the past because I've got to do a video update and then I got a bunch of other work to do um, in regards to my other filming projects that I'm working on. And then I got to head over to the uh, the other garden to just basically bust my ass. Uh, getting ready for our next inventory push. Um, haven't really been doing much business in the uh, the clone world here in almost two weeks um, because I'm just kind of in the uh, the process of building up inventory. So, my God, looks like there are a lot of questions here. I haven't looked at this here in a few days, but it looks like we do have a lot of questions. So, um, let's see here, guys. Who is saying what? And uh, I got my font set here a little bit small, but I think I should be able to read these. So, okay, this is from Vincent again. Um, sent us a lot of questions on the last show. He says, how important is EC and PPM when growing in cocoa? I am a new grower using cocoa, and I got myself a lower-end pH tester that doesn't test EC or PPM. My grow shop guy says if I keep the pH between 5, 5, 6, 2 in cocoa, I should be okay. All the testers I see measure EC and PPM are about $200. So I wanted to know if it was a necessity. And uh, the answer to the question is... Well, it's hard. It's a hard answer. Um, I would I would want to say yes, yes, it's a necessity. But I've done grows without a PPM meter many times with 
great success. So it's truly not as a necessity. You know, it's not necessary to, to have a good grow. But I would say that if uh, you know you know your regimen really well, and you know where the PPMs lie after you put combinations of products together, then yeah, EC PPM is, is next to useless. Um, but if you're messing around with things where you kind of have to check your work, and you know you might make a mistake, and then you know you want to check to see if your PPMs are indeed too high, then it's an invaluable tool. Um, you know, and I always like to use the uh, the EC PPM and pH all one product, obviously. Um, I use the uh, the trimeter or the the blue lab combo meter I think they call it, which is my go-to product for all that stuff. I really don't like using anything else, and it really kicks ass. And it's uh, way more than two hundred dollars actually for the one that I use. It's you know closer to three hundred dollars, but worth every penny. And I highly recommend using them. Uh, let's see. This is from David. Do you add additives or base nutrients to the reservoir first? I've heard people say to add additives to the reservoir first, then add your base uh, to desired PPM. I would like to hear what order you add your nutrients to your reservoir, um, or if it even matters. Yeah, I don't really think it matters, dude. <clears throat> I think if, you're, if there's anything you want to do, you want to maybe not introduce your A and your B's successive right after each other. Um, but that would be just about it. I mean, you could start with overdrive, and then you could go A, and then you know, fucking your biocatalyst, your enzyme, then B. Um, there are some products that want to be introduced first, though, before you start doing anything else. Uh, potassium silicates are generally a good idea to get out of the way first, so they break down properly. I know that with the Aptis line, um, they recommend that you run the uh, facilitor uh, first before you do anything else, or your plants will fucking die, supposedly. Plants are probably going to die anyways if you use Aptis, but yeah. You want to you want to uh, kind of look out for products like that. Um, you know, if you're going to be adding powders, you know, you want to break those down first. I think, generally speaking, um, if you have a combination of liquid solubles and uh, you know crystalline or powder nutrients. But other than that, I, I really can't say uh, with any certainty that you know I, I added something in the wrong order and got some really horrific results, and it was due because of that. You know what I mean? So. I really don't think it matters, but like I said, if you want to play it safe, just introduce your A and Bs apart from one another, you know, non-successive. Um, let's see here. It looks like Ali Cat actually has a no question, but just a comment. He's all enjoying the show so far. You definitely need a producer, and no, I'm not volunteering. May I suggest having scheduled segment breaks where you run video of your gardens while playing music? Viewers can get a video update of all your gardens from the previous week, and you get to break to get your head right, review comments, and prepare for next segment. Just a thought. Uh, grateful for what you are doing. Peace. Um, yeah, I would like to do that, but I would have to have a producer to make it really easy for me. It's uh, difficult to do you know, these types of commentary um, while loading up and queuing video and shit. You know what I mean? Uh, not to mention that I have to do a lot of preparation to do that because this uh, fucking Medicam software, uh, it doesn't allow me to use the really high quality video that comes right off my camera. So um, I've got a couple cameras now, and you know I can either record in ABC HD, which is an, uh, you know uses the MTS file format, and uh, the Minicam software doesn't know fuck all to do with that. But uh, I thought that if I would record in just MP4, in which I get you know .mov files um, or you know MPEG4 files, whatever, that that would be able to normally you know be played through the Minicam. But I was wrong again. Um, in fact, you know, I have to take my video into my editing suite and have it re-rendered, you know, as a uh, like an AVI file or something like that in order for it to be replayed through Minicam, and that's a lot of fucking preparation, you know, to make the videos, to make them long enough, and then to um, you know re-render them out just for use in playback on the live show. And keep in mind that the resolution of the show is gonna be fucking horrible um, over the uh, the Google Hangouts, you know, because there's such or there's so much compression added to the video. That the quality would be shit, you know, and, and music also sounds absolutely horrible over the live show. And uh, I think that these are things that I'm probably going to do, you know, if the uh, you know the compression protocols for video and audio over web get significantly better. Uh, and you know, I'd like to be able to just broadcast HD samples over, you know, but we're not quite there yet. So we'll see. Um, yeah, and, and plus, getting a producer to volunteer their time and to physically have to be here to do that kind of shit. Is another you know tall order, and you know we'll we'll see how it goes. You know, I, I guess if the show were to like get some kind of crazy sponsor, sure. But 
you know, as of right now, guys, we've got you know 64 people uh, watching the show, <coughs> and I don't think that that's going to be uh, <coughs> enough to really get any kind of outside support. So we're just gonna have to do our best. So uh, looks like another question here from Vincent. He says, uh, when setting up a grow for profit entity, what is the legal process as pertains to Cal Prop 215? I have a doctor recommendation and in the process of filing a nonprofit court for mutual benefit. Is there anything else I need? And do you recommend insuring the business? Um, it, it depends, man. You know, honestly, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I'm not even really qualified to answer this question. Um, I have a lawyer, and he handles all this crap, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I know some of the specifics, but maybe not as much as what you're asking for. Um, when you talk about legal processes as it pertains to Cal Prop 215, there really aren't any. I mean, if you've read Cal Prop 215 and, and the uh, the SB 420 bill, it doesn't talk anything about legal processes for setting up a for-profit entity. I don't believe that language is even referred in, in any way, shape, or form in those documents. So whatever you do is kind of like ad hoc, right? And uh, you know, the government's viewpoint on it is going to change and it remains to be fluid and a huge problem to this day. Um, to be honest, we should just get rid of the goddamn, you know, uh, these stupid corp prop entities and just do things like any other corporation or company does. I mean, that's kind of what I've always wanted is full legalization, a full equal playing field for all parties involved. But, uh, you know, right now we're, we're still kind of playing these fucking stupid ass games and, you know, paying $800 a year for corporate protection that may not even be protection, you know. So it's a real pain in the ass. I fucking hate it. Um, but I've got the money to pay for it, so I do, <clears throat> in the hopes that it will possibly help me if, if shit hits the fan. But, you know, honestly, you know, just trying to avoid shit hitting the fan is really the best uh, course of action. So, okay. Um, there's a long question here. This is from uh, Jason. It's a, somewhat of a novel. And there's also a picture. And I want to see if this picture here is... Yeah, I don't think it's going to be so high-res where it's going to crash... The, uh, the application, so bear with me guys while I download this picture and get it loaded into the app so you guys can all see it, and then we will go ahead and proceed to uh, read this question here from Jason. So let's see how fast I can possibly do this. Um, images, open files from my download directory, and where the fuck is it? Here it is. All right, guys, cross your fingers. Let's hope the application, application doesn't crash. Oh, it didn't crash. Good. All right, cool. So, yeah, here's a picture that he went ahead and sent, and here is his question. He says, what's up, Sub? You answered my question last week about recirculating DWC setups. You mentioned using vertical bul bulbs. My question is, what layout would you recommend for my room if you were going to upgrade it? Money not being an issue. My new flower room is 10 by 13 by 8. I have 24K mini split. Uh, bottled CO2 oscillating fans, dehumidifier, 55-gallon reservoir, 7-gallon botanicare, Hercules pots, and tomato cages, hand-watering, wand, etc. Right now, I'm running 4,000 watts with my with small-ass Daystar hoods uh, bought used for really cheap with magnetic ballasts. My plan was to upgrade to adjustable digital ballasts and either adjust wings or maybe Raptors or, or Magnum Triple XLs. Because my AC is so strong, I don't air-cool my hoods with the 4K, but I was wondering about upgrading this room to a 6k if temps become an issue I would air cool them what wouldn't what there wouldn't be a lot of working room but I'm fairly slim and I don't mind being right up right up on my plants would you do the 6k horizontal hoods or if doing vertical what would you suggest and how would you lay them out how many RDWC sites would you build under the layout also what nutrient regimen would you use for recirculating DWC I attached some pics of my room I had to replace the motherboard on my air conditioner so nothing is planted in here at the moment and I put the T5 there just to get out of my way and I swear I had the Home Depot floor first. I had to laugh when I saw you use it in the nursery. Um, I get all great mind I guess all great minds think alike. I'm also covering hardwood floors. Anyways, sorry for the book long email. Thanks for all the insight. Much respect, Jason. Okay, well, <clears throat> to talk about the whole vertical thing, uh, the only reason re I, I don't necessarily recommend vertical is simply because I just don't know that much about vertical, you know, to be terribly honest with you. Um, we, we have a, another person of ours that we, we grow with, and he does uh, vertical style and is actually able to get, like, double the yields on or, you know, equal yields as we do on, like, half the wattage because he grows around the plants. 
uh, using reverse, or I'm sorry, recirculating deep water cultivation. But uh, I'm not like a huge fan of the layout. And, you know, my rooms, it doesn't really, it's not really preferable to do it in rooms of my build. Um, although a buddy of mine would be a perfect candidate to try something like that. Um, and I've got a lot of experience with DWC, but, you know, because it's not really something that I'm doing, I don't really see how it would make sense for me to recommend it. Although I can tell you right here, just from looking at your room pictures, that you definitely want to get rid of those goddamn hoods. Yeah, I mean, those things are shit. Uh, you know, based on the size, I mean, yes, you could fit 6K in that room. No doubt about it. However, I think that, uh, you know, you'd get something more along the lines of, of what went wrong with the Epic 6K. You know, we were stuffing way too many lights in there, and it wasn't it wasn't worth it. And even though you've got the 24K BTU, um, Mini split, which is enough. That's way than more than powerful enough to, to cool down six non air cooled thousand watts. You know, I got a buddy that, that does two of them right next to each other with two 24K splits, and, and his rooms stay amazingly cool. Um, I think you should stick with 4K, and I think you should dump these uh, piece of shit hoods, get the Adjust the Wing Avengers. Don't waste your time on the Magnum Triple XLs or the Raptors. They're not designed for non air cooled operation, really. I mean, yeah, they are kind of, but they're really designed for air-cooled operation. You know, so get those four reflectors, the exact same ones that I use. Get digital dimmable ballasts. Although with that 24k BTU split AC, uh, don't plan on dimming your reflectors much. You're probably really not going to have to do that. Um, yeah, and and do that. Okay. Um, I would avoid doing the whole vertical thing for now. I don't really think you've got the space for it. You know, with the room only being a 10 by 13 by 8. Uh, you need a little bit more widening berth to do stuff like that. Um, and this room is is decent, you know, at 10 by 13, but honestly, man, it's like the exact same size as, like, my uh, my Epic 4K or the Moneymaker, you know, kind of somewhere in between, I guess. So, yeah, guys, keep or keep it keep it straightforward. Use adjust the wings, and um, you should have some terrific results, especially with that mini split running DWC. You'll be able to keep your temperatures real low, and it should be spectacular, you know. I'm, yeah, I think that your uh, your shit should kick ass. And yeah, I love your flooring too, by the way. I think it looks really great. Uh, so that takes us over to our next question. Um, this is from K Kin, I guess. This is a uh, sub sub. How are the Max fans you used a while back? The eight inch. Are they really more quiet? And did they exhaust well? Um, they are not more quiet, and they exhaust decently. Um, you know, CFM wise, they're actually a little bit lower than what you can get with most 8 inch fans. I believe that the Max Fan 8 is rated at about 675 CFM, and you can get fans um, in the 8 inch size that are well above 700. I mean, even the cap value line, I believe, is rated at 745 CFM. The only real benefit to running the Max Fan 8 is to take advantage of its inline form factor. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, if you saw uh, how I had them configured in the Epic. Uh, 6K, it makes a lot more sense. You know, you can keep a cluster of the fans very close together when you've got really small spaces to do your, your ducting and exhaust, which is something you don't really get with the large, you know, centrifugal fans, you know, which are very large and bulbous, and they require, you know, mounting brackets that really protrude a lot. And if you've got a small amount of space to work with, you really can't run those fans inline. You know, they got to be run perpendicular, and it requires curvature, which could be complicated, you know, if you're trying to get a, a nice inline ducting run going and you don't want to deviate. Uh, that's where the Max Fan kind of comes in. But yeah, they kick ass. You know, I fucking love them. So I uh, don't have any particular use for them anymore at this point. But I still do like them um, very much. So it actually looks like, guys, uh, there's another one here. Um, a bunch of pictures. And I don't know. It's weird. These ones are like embedded in the mail and I can't just click on them to bring them up. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to save these pictures quite like I did before, but we're going to try. Hold on here, guys. Yeah, it doesn't even look like that these images are saving actually as image files, but hold on. But I'll go ahead and read the, the question anyways. So I don't have to sit here. Um, hey, Sub. Um, happy Cinco de Mayo. I wanted to follow up on last week's question when you explained aggressive perpetual cloning for me. If I keep... Uh, if I keep a uh, seems like an amount of bud produced would be worth it. What? Um, I'm building a large room in my garage right now. Two by 1,000 watt HPS in the flower room. 
with an ebb and flow system and a 1000 watt metal halide for mother veg. Should I use CFL or metal halide for clones? Thanks for all you do. Okay, Monty. That's from Monty, by the way. Sorry. Um, well, for clones, uh, either one will work, but if you're going to be keeping metal halide 1000 watt, it better be far the fuck away from those clones. Uh, generally, I like to uh, you know use a single strip T5 for unrooted, and generally nothing more than an April T5 for rooted. That is, of course, if we're talking in the uh, you know the two inch block style. And uh, just to give you guys give you guys a, an, an idea of what he's doing here, I'm gonna try to bring up his his photos, but I don't know if I will be able to do that. Yeah, it's weird. When I click the link to download, there's no... Oh, it does actually work. Okay, so... Yeah, we'll get them both here in just a second. So, yeah, it looks like I did load the image file, but the computer does not seem to know how to make heads or tails of it. So, yeah, I guess in the future, don't send your attachments the way that, uh, the way that um, Monty did here. But, um... Yeah, I mean, if that's your only question, it's pretty straightforward, you know? It does work. I mean, I've had gardens set up where... We actually have, um, you know, all the clones are rooted from just ambient HPS lighting. In fact, we had a, an entire G13 of cloning garden that worked that way. It was fucking awesome. So, yeah, it should be good for you as well. Um, just, to, you know, for small plants, keep it far as fuck away as possible. But, you know, I'd, yeah, CFLs are generally the better way to go. So, and let's see, guys. This one here is coming from Kurt. He says, hey, Sub, got your info on imidacloprid uh, use, and when I bought mine from the gardening center, they were adamant on how dangerous the properties could be and dispose of hydroponic water should be best put in a sanitary drain, not sewer or leach fields to ensure likely, likelihood that the limited amounts get into any habitat. With that said, I found um, optrol insecticide, 21.4% point, concentrate, is this close to the percentage that your use at one milliliter per gallon is? And do you share the belief that 60 days growth is good enough for so-called half-life of the chemical? Um, if anyone has anything to say about contamination, might I remind that most local stores are not limited to the sale of insecticide chemicals on this scale. And most laws state that legal nature of use, not sale of such products, not to mention that any traps and other insecticides people use that have a much more likelihood of agricultural contamination than any indoor grow. Thanks, dude, and keep it up. I also share the quality of lawful freedom and just doing the right thing. May that outlook protect you in all your endeavors. Peace. Um, okay, well, to uh, do a comparison, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't have... The uh, the Merit by Bear bottle. I actually just bought a brand new one. It was huge. Um, I think it was a 500 milliliter uh, bottle that I got for 85 dollars. Which, you know, my imidacloprid concentrate, uh, you know, it's one to two milliliters for every five gallons. Uh, that's the suggested use. Although I'm going to look that that up more specifically from the manufacturer. You know, that's just the recommended from the hydro store, and that's what I've been using it at. But I would like to get a little more clar clarification on that. Um, as far as it uh, being this horribly dangerous, well, uh, you know, you should probably look online and see, uh, you know, what it said about imidacloprid. And, in fact, I can just go ahead and do this right the fuck now <clears throat> and tell you guys what's up. Because there has been a lot of bullshit spread about these uh, types of, you know, insecticides, pesticides that, you know, they're, they're more dangerous than, um, you know, than, than what people like to make them out to be. So, Let's see here. Imidacloprid is currently the most widely used insecticide in the world. Although it is now off patent, the primary manufacturer of this chemical is Bayer Crop Science, part of Bayer AG. It is sold under many names for many uses. It can be applied by soil injection, tree injection, application to the skin of the plant, broadcast foliar, ground application as a granular or liquid formulation, or as a pesticide coated seed treatment. Imidacloprid is widely used for pest control in agriculture. Other uses include application to foundations to prevent termite damage, pest control for gardens and turf, treatment of domestic pets to control fleas, and protection of trees from boring insects. Recent research suggests that widespread agricultural use of imidacloprid and other pesticides 
may be contributing to honeybee colony collapse disorder. The decline of honeybee colonies in Europe and North America observed since 2006. As a result, several countries have restricted use of amidacloprid and other uh, neon content, whatever the fuck, I can't pronounce that, neon neonicotinoids. Um, in January 2013, the European Food Safety Authority stated that um, these products pose an accept unacceptably high risk to bees and that the industry-sponsored science upon which regulatory agencies' claims of safety have relied on may be flawed or even deceptive. So that's basically it, you know. Uh, there's obviously a lot of, um, you know, debate on whether, you know, obviously if it affects bee populations, that can, you know, obviously become a little bit more of an issue. Um, in regards to toxicology, based on laboratory rat studies, imidacloprid is rated as moderately toxic on an acute oral basis to mammals and low toxicity on a dermal basis by the World Health Organization and the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Um, class 2 or Class 3 requiring a warning or caution label. It is rated as unlikely carcinogen and weakly mutagenic by the US EPA, Group E. It is not listed for reproductive or development toxicity, but it is listed on EPA's Tier 1 screening order for chemicals to be tested under the Endocrine Disruptor Screening Program. Tolerances for imidacloprid residues in food range from 0 0.02 milligrams per kilogram in eggs to 3 milligrams per kilogram in hops. Animal toxicity is moderate when ingested orally and low when applied dermally. It is not irritating to the eyes or the skin in rabbits and guinea pigs, although some commercial preparation contain clay as an inert ingredient which may be an irritant. The acute inhalation LD50 in rats was not reached um, at any greatest attainable concentrations. Uh, 69 milligrams per cubic meter of air as an aerosol, which is a fuckload, by the way, and 5,323 milligrams uh, AI M to the eighth power of air as dust in rats subjugated to a two-year feeding study. No observable effect was seen at 100 parts per million. That's also a shitload. Um, in rats, the thyroid is the organ most affected by imidacloprid. Thyroid lesions occurred in male rats at a, a low at a at a LOAEL of 16. milligrams AI slash kilograms per day uh, in a one-year feeding study in dogs. No observable effect was seen at 1,250 ppm's, while levels up to 2,500 ppm uh, led to um, hypocholesterolemia, and elevated liver cytochrome P450 measurements. And those PPMs are crazy, guys. I mean, that's, you know, PPMs that I won't even get to with a full-blown feeding. And this is just pure imidacloprid. And for all you guys that understand what the, uh, the LD50 is, it's basically the median lethal dose, right? So the median lethal dose is met when, say, you have 100 people and you're testing something on them. And you keep giving them that shit, and when it kills 50%, you've then determined the LD50. And it's incredibly high. You know, we have to inject crap loads of this stuff uh, for it to have toxic effects on humans. You know, obviously, as a pesticide, it is going to have, you know, things going on with it, which is why I don't use imidacloprid at all whatsoever in any flowering application. You know, it's only for mother plants specifically or very, very small vegging plants. So... I hope I didn't go off to too much of a tangent there, but there it is. Okay, uh, moving right along. And another thing, too, I want to add is that, you know, imidacloprid, you know, at least as of lately, has not really been that terribly effective, you know, and uh, we're going to have to see about, you know, continued use of it. But we did pick up a whole crop load of it. We're going to see what we can do with it. Um, let's see. Hey, Sub, hope you can make time for me. Uh, oh, this is basically a clone request. Yeah, well, we'll see. And this looks like it's actually going to be the last question on the Q&A &E queue. We didn't get that many questions, which is a good thing because I don't really have that much time uh, for this show today. But uh, Yo, Sub, what up, brother? Had a couple of questions for your live show, although for whatever reason I have been unsuccessful in my many attempts at signing on and watching live. May have something to do with the Apple products I use or not. I really don't know. Anyways, on to the questions. Uh, so I have been using House and Garden Nutrients whole lineup ever since I started growing. The other day I was at the Hydro 
grocery store and I asked if there was any other products I could or should be using to help out. I believe that they are very biased, may even be sponsored by whatever, by House and Gardens. So they said that there wasn't anything that I should be adding at any point. I run a top feed drip recirculating system and I was wondering if you had any knowledge um, of any products that will work well with my lineup. Due to the fact that I cannot view the live broadcast, I will not be able to respond with any follow-up questions. However, I will email again next week if needed. Thanks in advance. Kyle. Okay, well, uh, the fact you're not getting the live show, I'm not exactly sure, although I am seeing here that you said sent from your iPhone. That might have something to do with it. But uh, generally speaking, to get the live show, you only have to be checking your subscription inbox uh, when I start the broadcast. and You'll see the live show there, and you can just join up and, um, yeah, you'll be able to catch the show live. And for whatever reason, if you don't get those links in your email inbox, if you go to facebook.com forward slash sublbc or check out my Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash sublbc, you will see a YouTube URL link. You click on that link and that will take you directly to the live show as it is happening. That is, of course, if you're here right at 7 p.m. Um, when the show actually begins. So, um, yeah, uh, now let's go ahead and talk about your question. Um, you know, I've done House and Garden, obviously, with the whole uh, nutrient shootout, and I really dig House and Garden. Um, there was a grow, actually, where I did the, the House and Garden nutrients um, along with uh, some advanced additives and some other things, and it was one of my early on um, SFEOG grows, and uh, it actually did fairly well. I mean, it wasn't fucking horrible. Wasn't the greatest thing in the world, but uh, you know, as a complete line, I think House and Garden is one of the better lines out there, especially for cocoa. I mean, they've got a you know a dedicated cocoa's AB product. Um, they got great additives. I really love the allergen extract. Um, they've got a really expensive um, you know biocatalyst in their uh, their amino treatment. Um, but all in all, it's a, it's a really great line, and I, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head that I would use along with. House and Garden to, to get better performance. You know, it's, it's something that I'd have to get a lot more experience with, and I just don't really have that much at this point. So I would say that if you're actually happy with what you're getting, then, uh, you know, keep it going, I guess. Um, and let's see, we've got a whole shitload of real-time comments that have been added. We're going to try to uh, get through as many of these as possible. And then, uh, yeah, i got to move on and get my work going. So let's see here. da 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 da, -da. Okay, so picking up kind of where we were leaving off with the uh, the last batch of comments. Um, sub or sup, what's your opinion on fossil load or Bushmaster to control your plant stretch during flower? I don't use those products. Um, I don't use anything that has PGRs. I avoid them like the plague and they fucking, I think they just suck. Uh, no one has been able to demonstrate to me definitively that they really help. I've had some people that say it's the greatest shit ever um, and then I look at their herb and it's not what I want, you know. And I've had some that say it just fucking sucks and that it, you know, drops quality of the herb. And I have seen that myself firsthand, especially with Bushmaster, which I think is one of the shittiest products out there. Phosphol load, I used to run it quite a bit. Again, I, I don't really see the point. Um, I'm not even interested in keeping the, the plant growth regulated on my, on my plants. I like letting them free grow. And I seem to get the best results when I do that. So, yeah, my opinion is fuck phosphol load, fuck Bushmaster, fuck gravity, fuck anything. That's made by Humboldt County's own. That's a Nazi company that makes garbage. People that run it are shitheads. Fuck, I wish I could meet one of them in real life. I would just love to punch them right in the face and break their fucking nose and watch them bleed while I smile. Anyways, um, next up, guys. Uh, does Blue Dream normally have a light green color? Um, yeah, I guess. Sure. Dark green, early going, gets a little more light green and turns straight fucking yellow at the end. Uh, let's see, Johnny Chestnut says, Sub, it seems you have run tested all the big name nutrient companies. Why hasn't Canna made it to your shelf for testing? Because Canna is a Nazi company. They are literally the biggest piece of shit company ever. Um, in fact, you know, when Canna, Canna will not send their products to Green Door. And they will not do so because there's actually another uh, uh, hydro store that, that's within a certain number of miles from another one of their stores that sells Canna. And for whatever reason, they only want Canna being sold in certain stores. They don't want to have too many stores all selling Canna in a concentrated area, which makes absolutely no sense to me because if someone's going to buy your products, they're going to buy your products. You know, as you as a manufacturer, don't you want your products in as many places as you could possibly put them, right? I mean, that's what I've always thought. 
that's clearly what um, Canada's competitors think, you know, especially Advanced Nutrients, who is literally fighting tooth and nail to put their products in as many places, period, they possibly can, whether it be a hydroponic store or anywhere else. So yeah, Canna, you know, another one of those piece of shit companies run by morons. You know, they're Canadians, so what can you say? Fuck them. You know, if, if they're going to be a company like that, that, you know, wants to, you know, basically micromanage all left-wing style where they want their products to be, you know, like, they essentially want to be like the Kim Jong-il of nutrient companies, then so be it. You know, I'm not going to uh, use their products, and I'm definitely not going to say anything nice about them. You know, they're overpriced and bullshit anyways, and I don't know anyone who uses them anyways, you know, aside from online people. So that's it. That's, you know, if Canna were to make their stuff, their, their stuff available locally, uh, I probably would give it a shot. But until then, fuck them, you know. They run their company like morons, and, you know, they probably cost themselves millions in sales. Maybe one day they'll go out of business because of it. That would be a great day. Um, let's see. We have, wait, oh, I guess H HBC423 is talking about um, how he's streaming HD. That's great. Uh, let's see. <laughs> this is a show about growing baby carrots hydroponically. That is correct. Very well, it could be at least. Uh, this is interesting. A lot of other YouTubers that do vids sound over medicated. How do you stay medicated and move through the world with a clear head, talking with intelligence, and doing day to day business with people? Um, experience. <laughs> Uh, let's see. What's your take on Gavita Pro Lights compared to just plain Jane Lights and Balance? Okay, uh, I've talked about the Gavitas a little bit. Uh, not so much their, you know, HPS systems or MH systems, their traditional systems, but more of their plasma-based systems, which, you know, um, I guess really awesome par spectrum, but less uh, intensity of a 150 watt HPS for $1,100. I don't know. You know, you think about that. Uh, pgrow420, hey sub, I wanted to know how do you flush using coco coir? Okay, the same way you flush soil or just about anything else. Let's see, can you use a screenshot? Oh, I think he was talking about the, uh, I guess it was the guy who sent the question with the shit. And, and yeah, I could do a screenshot, but I don't want to waste time with it. Um, it was really just a picture of a plant in a DWC pot anyways. But um, your other question in regards to perpetual cloning, uh, somehow your computer messed up the text. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't get that part of it. Uh, maybe you want to resend it to me in a little bit more crisper detail, and I will address it either later on the show or in the next episode. Um, do some more day in the lifestyle vids. Uh, love cruising through LA with sub. Yeah, uh, you know we're doing more vids like that. Uh, not so much day in the life vids, but more like the. Uh, well, I don't want to give it away. I mean, I, right now I'm working on like three different film ideas that I that I'm going to expand. Um, one of which is, is probably very easy to develop. You know, it involves a lot of uh, very basic story and voiceover with really great imagery. <clears throat> one is even easier than that, which is almost kind of like a, a music video style of the same nature. And the third would be an would be like almost a complete, uh, you know, autobiography of, you know, uh, not really a story based on my life, but of a grower's life who, you know, similar events have been shared. But that's a really aggressive project that's require a lot more resources than I have at my disposal. So um, yeah, but we are, we are going to be seeing a lot of stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of really expensive camera gear that I need to get to make these videos correct. You know, such as like, like uh, you know, cinema lenses, true geared cinema lenses, uh, you know, like uh, 50, or I need three actually, 35, 50, and 85 millimeter T1.5 cine primes. Um, also need to get a... Uh, whatchamacallit, the, uh, the three-axis gyro-stabilized uh, Movi MV7 when it comes out because I don't think I can quite afford the MV10 at $15,000. I'm also going to have to invest in a new full-frame uh, camera for doing video capture since the, the current APS-C version that I've got um, really is going to give me the kind of wide angle, you know, especially with some of the lenses that I plan on using. You know, if you want to run 35 millimeter, it's much better to do it on full frame. And the cinema style lenses that I have are designed strictly for full frame sensors. Although they will work on APS-C uh, crop sensors. But anyways, I don't want to get too much into a camera discuss discussion, only to say that I've got a lot of money to spend, a lot of work to do. And when those videos are produced and created, they will be made available either on this channel or other channels here on YouTube. Okay, uh, it says, P.S. I noticed on some bags of cocoa it states never to water with plain water. Always use nutrients. If this is true, how do you flush? Um, well, you know, uh, when you're getting towards the end of your grow and you're, there's plenty of nutrients packed into that cocoa, I can guarantee you that. Uh, let's see. This is from 
Nusimia, it says, uh, again, if I, keep, if I keep a fully matured mother plant, as you suggested, can I flower the clones shortly after the roots develop? Is aggressive perpetual flowering a thing? Yeah, um, I think there's actually someone here on YouTube that does it. Many growers on YouTube do it. You know, where essentially, uh, you know, the moment the, the plants are put into flower, right before so, they take a bunch of cuttings from those flowering plants, and then, it, you know, it takes two, three weeks to veg, you know, which is five weeks remaining on the cycle. They use those five weeks to then veg those plants, and that is a 100% perpetual cycle, uh, meaning that you are actually using your, um, you know, flowering plants as breeding stock for the next. And you can generally keep this going um, infinitum as long as you take incredibly high-quality clones and use some kind of cull ratio, meaning that you're not using all of your clones, that you're always leaving behind the shittiest ones and focusing on the best. Um, however, if you start running into problems doing that, you know, you start getting pheno drift or genetic drift in which the, the strength is, is weakened, and then you've got to take the plants aside and re regrow them as traditional mothers, you know, selecting for the, um, you know, the characteristics that you want, and you're not going to obviously be able to do that perpetually. So, but as long as you keep doing things correctly, you could do it just about forever, I would imagine, but it's not something that I like to do. Uh, I like to keep mother plants in, you know, large form, production style, to make sure I'm always getting the highest quality cuttings that I possibly can from mother plants that were designed to be mother plants. So, uh, let's see. Hooked on Chronic says, real money is outside sub. Why haven't you gone outside for a year? Can't say I quite understand that question. Let's see. Uh, sub, bro, seriously, what has kept you from starting from seed and ex or exploring genetics at all? You don't seem to stray from your SFV or the Blue Dream. I'm probably one of the few that remembers um, the sour grapes. Well, uh, the reason for that is because most of the people that breed genetics are fucking idiots, you know? Uh, these seed companies, they just produce so much fucking foul garbage <clears throat> that most people don't want that crap, you know? And, and, and I'm not going to do that work, you know? Let someone else do the fucking legwork and, and do all that hard work for me. I'm not going to do it. If I'm going to be investing in genetics that I'm going to be sharing with my people, they're going to be shit that I know for certain is kick-ass. And I only want to grow the stuff that I know is kick ass, you know? I've done a lot of experiments with other strains that turned out being fucking horrible. You know, the uh, Madman was not a, a huge favorite of mine, nor of any of the people that were buying it. The, uh, the LA Confidential was kind of weak. Um, all these weird Bubba strains, even though they some yielded well and they were decent, um, they weren't decent by my standards. You know, I mean, I want the best shit out there. Um, these fake bullshit OGs that I was dealing with. You know, all this stuff bred by idiots or, you know, renamed by even bigger idiots. Suffice to say, I don't have very much confidence in, in breeders and seed companies. You know, they'll put whatever they want out there. You know, the breeding, I think, is shit. You know, way too much inbreeding. Uh, they, they, a lot of their strains are weak, and uh, they don't know what the fuck they're doing, you know. These aren't scientific, uh, you know, scientifically trained geneticists. You know, they're just like stoners that are just like, yeah, dude, I'm going to like breed this and that, and it's going to make like a super version of this, and they really have no idea what the fuck they're doing. I'd say like 99%. <laughs> And for the ones that do, you know, I have, a, I have a strong urge that a lot of these super strains that are really that awesome are not being distributed um, directly to clientele. They're just not. They're being kept by the strain horrors, and they just grow them for themselves. So, you know, with that being said, I have absolutely no trust for those, for those guys. So fuck them, you know. If someone wants to make a really great strain and, and, and test it for me and do all the legwork, um, then, you know, I'll consider it. But that's why I pretty much stick with the, the clone-only stuff. Because in order for, for most strains anyways, to make it clone only means it had to be really good. Because no one's going to deal with constantly keeping a live plant and a mother plant alive if it's crap. But that's not always the case. You know, I've seen some people keep crappy fucking genetics in mother form too for whatever, you know, outrageous reason. So, And uh, let's see. Uh, this is from a Camp... Uh, camp Punch? Cam... Whatever the fuck. What do you guys think of these names? But uh, he says, uh, I am running ProMix HP, and some people tell me to feed when pots feel light, and others say feed when third day. I run seven-gallon nursery pots. What's your take on it? Uh, my take is that you do definitely want to have some kind of a drying effect going on in order to strengthen the root development. But you don't want it getting so, so much to the point to where the plants start limping. You know, somewhere in between is good. Um, yeah, you know, and they, they should feel somewhat light when you're about to water them. You know, you want your plants hungry for water when you water them, I guess. So, let's see, we got some, oh, wow, 14 new comments, Jesus Christ. Uh, let's see here. Let's 
Sorry, guys. I'm just kind of seeing if we have a... So he's strolling through them all. Should I get the Prada flops? <laughs> no, dude. You know, honestly, the uh, the Prada flip flops. I didn't buy those. By uh, they, you know, a lot of people talk about that. Um, I never actually bought those goddamn things. You know, it's kind of a joke. And um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've never fucking spent that much money on a pair of flip flops unless they were incredibly bomb. But these weren't. You know, they were like uncomfortable as hell, and I really didn't care for them. Um, at that price point, I can't see why anyone would. You know, I, you know, Prada is ridiculous, guys. Um, you know, aside from sunglasses, I can't say I'm too terribly interested in any of the shit that those fucking people make. Um, in fact, you know, I don't even think I've even been back to the Beverly Center since I made that video, guys. That's how that's how much things have changed, uh, you know, since those days. Um, let's see, SB the DJ says I seem to be having some problems uh, pHing my cocoa coir. Where can I find out what pH you use in your garden? Don't even understand uh, that question. Let's see, ever had an issue with botanic hair calmic plus getting cloudy? No, but I have had that issue with the uh, the silica blast and pretty much all potassium silicates, which is why I generally um, want to have those things introduced, uh, you know, first. Oh, Canada is Dutch. My bad. Yeah, I thought they were Canadian. I guess I was getting them confused with advanced nutrients. Um, let's see. PGRs are in a lot of the products you use. Tricantanol is the main one. Um, I don't think tricantanol is used in any product that I use. I've not seen it listed as an ingredient on any product that I use, so I don't know about that. Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. And I think that pretty much does it, guys. Um, all the questions are in. I don't think that we've got any more questions here from the uh, from the Q and A email address. Q and A email address. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, guys, so just let everyone know, again, if you guys want to have your questions answered, the email address for the live show, <clears throat> subwcqna at gmail.com. Uh, keep them good, keep them concise, and uh, you know, try to make sure you attach your photos properly so they can be used in the live show. And another thing, too, guys, if you are going to send me uh, stuff to be used in the live show, be sure to uh, crop it down to, like, a lower resolution. You know, don't, don't send it over to me and fucking... 4K res, you know, something, you know, under a megapixel would be great. Uh, maybe a little higher, you know, but nothing, yeah, just, you know, keep the resolution good so it doesn't crash my uh, my mini cam application because if it's something that I can't work with, then, you know, we're just going to skip your photos. And I know a lot of you guys are trying to get your photos in. But in any case, guys, uh, like I said here at the beginning of the video, I've got a lot of work to do um, here in the garden. Uh, I'm going to be doing a video update from the Epic 4K that is right next door. It's been really exciting. Like I said, guys, I wanted to share with you, you know, some of the differences that we've seen uh, since doing our little overdrive spike because I think that that helped quite a bit in, in getting just some unusually amazing productivity from that garden. But, yeah, guys, that's going to be coming up in the next video. Like I said, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them. Otherwise, email them directly to me at sublbcqna at gmail.com. So, yeah, again, guys, I really do appreciate all of you guys taking the time out of your day to join me here in the live show, at least all 70 or so of you. And uh, just like we always do, guys, next week we'll be doing another one. And uh, stick around for that. Should be a lot of fun. So, again, guys, thanks a lot for showing up and taking part.